let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to come before your presence. We came because we know you love us. We came because we know you have something to give us. We are asking that you meet us at the point of our need this afternoon in Jesus' name. Bless us mightily in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37. We have these comforting words from the pen of the Apostle Paul. A man who could write this after he has gone through all the battles he went through in life must have done something. He saw battles in life. In every area of life he saw trouble. And yet, writing from the plain and the mountain of victory, he has penned down these words for the encouragement and comfort of all who are coming behind. He knew that life was a raging storm for him. Idol worshippers were against him. Philosophers were against him. The very power of the Roman government and empire came against him. Human beings also with their intellect, their energy, their power, their ability to work mischief were against him. And yet he was writing with an attitude, understanding and testimony that no matter where you are, no matter where you live, no matter what you are doing, how old or young, there is victory for you if you just know how to get it. You know, some of us, when we have little trouble, we just put a blanket over ourselves, close our eyes, roll over, and just say, well, I will never do well. There is no victory for me. You know, Paul didn't think like that. He in Romans chapter 8 verse 37 Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us in uh, verse 35 to verse 39 he talked about almost every type of experience in life in verse 35, he talked about tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, so he even talked about death in verse 36. In verse 38, he talked about angels and principalities and power. He talked of things to come and things present. Imagine about the height, about the depth of any creature on earth and the sky under the earth. He thought about their frowns, about their mischief, about their ability to do evil. And yet he said in the middle of the whole passage, saying, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And that's why we're looking at the message of victory and success this afternoon. In four areas of our lives, we are concerned with victory and success. Our personal, private lives, we think 
thinking about success and victory. You know when you think about yourself, you have three pictures in front of you. There is a picture of who you are right now in reality. That's the reality, that's the truth about you. There is a picture that you want other people. So see about you and it's slightly different from who you really are. And you know we try to come up in our image and picture when we dress, when we talk, when we walk, when we sit down, when we write a letter, when we share something personal with another friend. We want him to see a particular image and picture about us. Then there is another image very far away from you. You are not pretending you are there yet, but you want to be there. If you are sick, you have a picture of yourself. Find the future. Well, standing, speaking, acting, running, walking, doing all that you are not able to do now. That's the picture you have in front. If you are suffering today, there is a picture you know of yourself. You are beaten down, you are reading down, you are pushed aside, you are relegated to the background, you are rejected, neglected by everybody. But you know, if you are suffering, there is a picture in front of you far ahead. The picture of a man who has no suffering. The picture of a man who has overcome all suffering. Free from all attack, free from all trouble, free from sickness. You have an image, a picture of a person that is happy and totally joyous and cheerful. You're always thinking of that picture ahead of you. A man that is not, not being taken care of, but taking care of other people. And there is one regret in life by most people. They know who they are. Picture number one. They know what they are camouflaging, pretending to be. Picture number two. They know when they get to the top of the ladder, if possible, they know what they would like to be. And the victory you want to have is not only to think of that picture far ahead, but to really get there. In your personal life, think about that pic picture, that image. When you get to that place, that's the victory, the success we're talking about. Think about your business life. You know, today you may be working. In the office, and the picture you you are really well, maybe just somebody that has been driven about. They command you, they control you. They give you query if you are late for five minutes. And the boss, the director, is always coming late for five hours. Nobody talks. You know the picture you have in your mind about yourself. The picture is far away. The picture of an independent worker. Having self-esteem and self-respect. When you get to the place of work, they know that is one of the most important indispensable workers in this office. As a typist today, when you type the letter, the, the director throws it to you. Say, well, you made so many mistakes there. 
gẹgẹ bi a ko we to ma se pe o fi ka te we loni ni bi ise ra won tun ju we pala so pe o te we na da da picture you have ahead of you is you type the letter and they look at it and they say this is super nothing to correct there every dot every semicolon every word is typed well and everything is just in a particular proportion you are wonderful as yeah. the picture you are waiting for i will not on road to see ni lokara re ni para re o na ni loni pe ni gba to ba te we to won wi pe ah agba eni ti o te we agba ya nu eniyan ni ibi to ye ki da ami dan ro wa o wa ni da ibi to ye ki da nu ro de wa o wa ni be awon ami to ya o ti awon kan ti o ye ku wa ni be gbogbo re lo se pe let me show the picture before you in your business life eni pe oni awuran kan ni waju re ni pa igbese aye ise what you are today you blame other people around you o ti o je lo mi se lo n te bi se lo n fi esu kan we lo mi na if i had more education pe bi mo ba le mo we si ni if they treated me well won ba se mi da da they gave me what i am worth on ba fun mi ni nkan ti o ye fun mi if they give me all that i am entitled to won ba fun mi ni gbogbo nkan ti o ye mi ni if i am known for who i am bi won ba ma mi gege bi mo se pe self respect the self esteem that i merit if they gave it to me i will be in a place greater than this world yo se kon gbe mi ga bi o se ye kon ma pon mi ti o ye kon fun mi ni don ba fun mi ni o ye ki wa ni ko ni gaju yi only say i have a picture in my business life ahead of me how can i reach there that's your question e ka ti o so ni pe oni awuran kan ni pa igbese aye ise re fun ojo ola bi pa oni mo si se de be le ni ibere okan re and in your marital life ninu gbe aye igbe yawo re i know you have an ideal you have a place on high you want to reach in your marital life mo mo pe on re re kan wa to fe se mo mo pe bi giga kan wa ninu igbe aye igbe yawo re ti o fe de you married already o ti se igbe yawo and you know your wife o si ma yawo and there is a real picture present picture of today about your wife awuran kan ni pa ti ojo But you know it was serious and sincere. We are not all there where we want to be. In the personal life, in the business life, in the business life, in the marital life, in the spiritual life. We are not yet there. You picture yourself as somebody in future. Open the Bible, be able to read it, understand it, interpret it well. But it's not so today. You picture yourself being able to pray. Tell mountains to move. But when you are not there today, you picture yourself having love in overflowing measure, having the life of Christ, the mind of Christ, manifesting the love of Christ. But you are not there today. But you have a picture ahead of you, and you say, "I am." getting to that point and that's what we are talking about how can you reach that ideal image in front of you in these four areas of your life personal life business life marital life and the spiritual life now let's read the words of the apostle paul again Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And there is a way you can have victory in your life. Have success in your life. Look around you and all the mistakes that has plagued you in the past. Everything will be washed away under the bridge like water. There is no image you have about yourself today. Hey, which is not possible by listening to God and following God. Ko si awon awuran kan ti o ti gbe ka waju re ni para re loni ti ko se se ni pa pe ti o te ti sile ti Olorun. As a student whatever image you have ahead of you. Gege bi omo lewe iru awuran iwo ki o ma ya ni para re. As a worker whatever goal you have ahead of you. Gege bi o si se iru ile pawo iwo ki o ni ni waju re. As a Christian believer worker or minister whatever goal you have ahead of you. Iba je o si se Christian ni tabi As a married man, married woman, as a family, whatever goals you have for yourself, for your wife, for your husband, for your children, for the family in total. Get get be any total shape. Be a oya la lo koni oti oti ni ayani tabi oti bi mo. Eh, oti ni idile for la re iru le pa yo oki oki beka waju re get get be idile. I want to show you that success and victory is possible. Mo fe mo da lo ju fe ashe yori ati ishe gunda ju. You say even for me. Eh, oti 
for me. Oh yes, it's possible for you. Ben, you say, say, for no matter how low today. Uh, be to go there, to even me. no matter how sinful today. The people that later became saints started as sinners. I want to do any to do any. I'm not going to do any. The people that came out in life later as bold people, they started as fearful and weak people. I want to just say, you need to change your mind. You want to do any to go to church? Go to church. The people who ended their lives uh, in wisdom and really wise and respected all over the world, they started as ignorant and foolish people. I want to party. You talk party. I don't want like get get beer. I want to go to church. Just look at here when you want to see Lagbara. Want to party. I want to enjoy with them. Some families you appreciate today you just see the relationship between the wife and the husband and then they're taking care of the children and everything is going so well they didn't start that way they started with confusion with misunderstanding with adjustment they had to settle i want to be lonely to read 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 to how is it possible to have the victory and the success in all these four areas of our lives? According to the word of God, the very first thing we need is the word of God. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. He will be, he could bother flow, yeah, no rest, you know. He won't match your shadow, you know, right? Leo Santi, you know, he was really here, see, I think I gave you a good way, see, I cost you know, right? Need to really buy none, you know, she. In Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3 Here we are told in the record of the holy writings again How we can have success and victory in all areas of our lives Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly Nor standeth in the way of sinners now sit us in the seat of this comfort. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit. In his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Yosi da bi giti agbe si e ti i pao do, ti so e so re, jade li a koko re, e we re ki yosi re, a ti o ti o she, ni yo ma she de de. In Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22. Inu, we o, we o, ri kenya se o gunde ike jile lo gun. My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear. Unto my saints. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart for their life. Unto those that find them, health to all their flesh. And and in Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 you know where Matthew or can you say can you? Jesus has revealed a deep truth concerning the word of God Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 but he answered and said it is written man shall not lay by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God Many people exist, but they don't really live. They are abundant life. A joyous life. A successful life. A victorious life. They are not living. But Jesus said, here is a secret. That man shall live joyously, happily, victoriously, successfully, 
by the word that proceeded forth out of the mouth of God. Now understand this. You are the biggest hindrance for yourself in the way of success and victory. All these verses we have read, they recognize that the devil is in the world. All these verses recognize and they take it for granted. Enemies are in the world. But the Bible makes it clear that if you don't succeed, it's not the it's not the fault of the enemies. It's not the fault of those who are against you or hindering you. Because there is a way of escape out of every problem and trouble. And we have read it in the book of Joshua that I read to you. If you will read this word of God, receive the word of God, meditate on the word of God, act on the word of God. Everywhere, every time, you will make your way prosperous. You know, we read many books about marriage. But many of these books don't tell us the whole truth. The Holy Ghost has a monopoly on the truth. It's the only one that can lead you into all truth. Psychology can lead you into all truth. The books of scholars and writers cannot lead you to all truth. The Holy Ghost has a monopoly on truth. And Jesus has said when the comforter is coming will lead you to all truth. That's in the word of God. You want a successful marriage? This word shall not depart out of your mouth. A successful marriage, this word shall not depart out of your mouth. Read it and receive it. Meditate on it and act it out, behave it and observe it to do it. You will have a successful marriage. You are thinking of how your business can prosper. The word of God has so much to say about your business. How to plan, how to get workers, how to train the workers. How to be considerate on your work. How to love all people who are working with you. How to give them jobs that are proportionate to all the, to their ability. How to reward them when they do good. How to show love to them and make them to do the best of the work you want them to do. How to be honest. How not to cheat. How to be hardworking, fervent in business. How to know when to rest and when to work. How not to get what belongs to the other people so you don't ruin yourself. How to build and yet build in such a way that others are happy with you. How to be prosperous and not to be proud. How when you fall in business not to be discouraged. The word of God has a lot to tell you about your business. And if that word of God will not depart from you as a businessman, as a worker in the office, you will prosper. How about your family? How to make a success of your family? How to deal with your in-laws? How to get into a new environment. How to settle with the neighbors there. How to get the love, the affection, the attention of your husband, of your wife. How to train your children. How to see them get on in life. All this is in the word of God. About your spiritual life, the Bible has a lot to say. And if you will give years to the word 
word of God. You will not let them depart from you. You will observe it day and night. The Bible says you will prosper. You will be successful. You will be victorious. By taking heed unto the word of God, you will live the abundant, cheerful, happy, joyous life. Deuteronomy chapter 11. We're looking at verse 18. Therefore, ye shall lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontless between your eyes. If you notice in that verse, it talks yes. of laying up the word of God. God's commandments, lay it up. God's instructions and teachings, lay them up. The warnings of God, lay them up. The promises of God, lay them up. In three places. In your heart, in your soul, in your hand, and also before your eyes, on your body. I know what you really think about it. Where man is made of these three parts or compartments. The spirit, the soul, and the body. And when the word of God is in the heart, it will not make the heart to go astray in paths that are dark. Your heart will not think of evil when the word of God is stored up in your heart. Remember it's the word of his love. The word of his grace. And you cannot think of evil, meditate evil, plan evil, be bitter, be angry, and want to injure another person when there is the word of God, the word of love inside your heart. Your soul is the area of your intellect, your mind, your your will, your emotions, your feelings. And when you come to think about it, the word of God in your soul affecting your will, affecting your intellect, affecting your mind, affecting your feelings, affecting your emotions. You know, the word of God in your soul will always give you pleasant emotions. And all these antisocial negative feelings and emotions emotions will be getting out of your life when the word of God is in your soul. And it says to bind the word of God for a sign upon your hands that they may be as frontless between your eyes. And then in verse 19, you shall teach them to your children Speaking of them when thou seest sitest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest now, when thou risest up. I'm sure you, do, you, mean, you know that that doesn't mean preaching 24 hours a day. So that everywhere you are, sitting or standing, lying or walking, you're always preaching, always quoting a verse, not at all. What you're saying is that let your life be a serious series of reactions, responses, obedience to the word of God you have laid up in your heart, soul, and body. When somebody offends you, remember the word of God, forgive and love. When your child asks a foolish question before you answer, remember the word of God. When Somebody troubles you with uh, too much uh, of things you don't like. Remember that the word of God says be patient. 
saw that word of God in your life and in your heart. Ni gba tene ka ba yo lenu pelu awon nkan ti oko fe ran iwo ran ti pe oro Olorun wi pe ti oni suru ko oro Olorun ijo sinu okan re ki o si ni fe. You get to your place of work be controlled by the word of God. O de bi se re je ki oro Olorun ma dari re. No you may be the top manager the director. O le je olotu to gadu lo tabi eni ti o ti alakosu agba ile. When you are passing through that gate in your be in your office. Ni gba ti oko ja lenu ona ni ni ile ise. And you see the receptionist there. O si ri awon to ngba de ju wa le be. Of God. Make in the similitude of God. Don't put her down. Don't snub her. Don't abuse her. Let her know that she is a creature of God respected. And appreciated. You see the, you see the gate man by the way. In your place of work. And your, the word of God is inside your heart, your soul, and your body. It's the word of God that makes you to smile. Plant a flower of love in that gate before the gate man, before you pass in. Don't just bow down your heads and carry a big Bible as if you never see anybody that is suffering around. You see a customer in the place of work that is in trouble. Give your extra time, your free time, your lunch time. Help that person. That's the word of God in your heart, in your soul, in your body, in your mouth. Yeah, koko ti o wa ni o minira. Koko ati lo jeon re. Koko ati lo simi re. Sile la ti ran. Allah wa ele ni o rolo ni o kani ni e mi ati ara re. Two child that has missed way, has missed the father and the mother crying because at all the environment is like a strange land to him. Give time. Be with that child. Come for the child. Take the child up and ask for the need of the child. That's the word of God in your heart, in your soul, in your body. Ori ama keke re kato ti shina ti o ma biti amu bire wa ni tori ki agbe bito wa o sha jiji si ori lati fa mara ki ogbe ki o bire ki lo ni lo ki o si re ele ni oro lo ni no kan ni no emi ati ara re. You see some work in your place of work. Ori amu shi shaka ni bi share re. A little thing has happened. Ni kake kere ti shale. Immediately it's writing a letter of resignation. Let's say kese obe si nko wipe mwa bi shesi le. And he says this is an insult. How can the manager do like that to me? Don't say well it doesn't concern you whether he resigns or not. Remember he has children. Remember he has a wife. And he's resigning without thinking of what is the consequence of resignation. He wants to throw away bad water without getting clean water. Sit down with him and say my friend come. What happened to you? And he said, fool me, saying the manager insulted me. What letter are you writing? A letter of resignation. Have you got another word? Oh no. Do you have a wife? Yes, I have. Do you have children? Oh yes, I have. Are you paying for a house? Oh yes, I have. And you are resigning without getting a new job? Give me that letter. You get that letter from me. Have you discussed it with your wife? Go and discuss with your wife first. Before you resign. Tell your children first. Think about this insult they passed on you. Is that as weighty you are taking care of your family? Make, make peace between him and the manager. That's the word of God in your heart, in your soul, in your body. A man like that will succeed anyway. Where? If you are like that, your business will succeed. Your family will succeed. Everything about you will succeed. Well, it's not only the word of God. Look at verse 21. That your days may be multiplied. And the days of your children. You know, you will live long if you act according to the word of God. No worry, no anxiety. No anger, no bitterness. No impatience at all in your life. Everywhere you go, you're always happy. When people offend you, you say, well, that's just one person out of millions of people in Nigeria. When somebody, one person abuses you, remember 10 people who have been praising you and who has been loving you. And you, be, you remember, Jesus loves you. God loves you. The Holy Ghost loves you. Brothers and sisters love you. What does that single one
one matter. A person like that will live long. A person like that will live a happy life, a joyous life, a cheerful life. That your days may be multiplied, the days of your children in the land with the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. You live the day of heaven on earth if you are taking it to the word of God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. No, can it shall be opened unto you. In John chapter 16, verse 24. John 16, verse 24. Here Jesus is talking about prayer. Either to have ye asked nothing in my name, ask, and ye shall receive that your joy may be full. Matthew chapter 18. Should in case you ask and you have not received. You seek and you have not found. You knock and something is happening somewhere. It has not been opened unto you. According to the words of Jesus and the promise of God, you have asked in his name and you have not got the manifestation of the answer. That does not mean you are a loser. You can still be a winner. That does not mean that victory has forever bypassed you. You can still have the victory and be successful. Remember in your personal life, in your spiritual life, in your marital life, in your business life, the word of God is for your success and victory. Prayer will move you to victory and success. If you've done it and you have prayed and the success has not come, why not get another brother or sister around you? A praying one and pray together the face of the, both of you to take the mountain away. Matthew 18 verse 19 Again I say unto you that if you of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask if they it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven But suppose you have done that and you have not got the answers yet Maybe there is a mistake in your life that is hindering you Sometimes it's not really a sin that takes you out of the kingdom of God May just be an unresolved difficulty between you and your husband And both of you are burying that sin, you are hiding it And therefore it does not allow success and victory to germinate and bring forth fruit in your home the deal marriage you are thinking of is far away because of an offense that you are hiding, burying between you and in your business it may be that you have you know, gone into wrong business practice and even though you are now taking the word of God you are now praying, the answer has not come in your spiritual life, the victory you are looking for has not come. It no, may just be something you have to correct and restore to the other one. Make restitution and then the victory will start coming. Or actually it may be real sin. And this sin has made victory to go away 
from you. And God with superior eyes and to behold iniquity, saying until you correct that thing, I will not give you what you are expecting. If that is the case, understand that it's a simple, there's a simple way of dealing with that. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14. There's a mistake in your life that is hindering your victory. Bringing you under guilt and condemnation. Or there is a sin in your life that is stopping the victory and the success for your family. That doesn't mean that it's impossible to be successful. Second Chronicles 7 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Bi awon eyan mi ti a pe oruko mi mo bare ara won sile ti won ba si gbadura ti won ba si wa oju mi ti won ba si yi pada kuro ninu ona buburu won nigba na ni emi o gbo lati orun wa emi o si dari ese won ji emi o si wo ile won sun. It's a matter of just confessing it to the Lord and doing away with say. Ti eni kan jowo re fun Oluwa ni ki o si mu kuro lona re. You you found about Moses who later became a great leader. O ti gbo ni pa Moses to di olori omo awon omo Israel ni. And he in life he was a murderer but he confessed and God forgave him. Ni bere igbese aye re o je afani sugbon o jowo Olorun si dari. You found about Joshua who had the faith to stop the sun and was victorious in every battle. O ti gbo ni pa Joshua to ni o igbagbo ninu aye re to ti o da orun duro Earlier in life, he was seen considerate and selfish. He said, Moses should stop the other people who were prophesying in the camp. But he, for, he confessed it and God forgave him. Have you heard about David who later killed Goliath? Who earlier in life killed Goliath? But you see, after that, he went into sin. Now, he didn't commit suicide because of that. It will be foolish for you to commit sin and then go and commit suicide. Because when you do that, you are feeling that, well, I have committed sin, I have blown the lid of my kettle, therefore there is no remedy anymore. There is remedy. It means my sin is so great and God cannot forgive me. That is not true. No, God has said, if my people who are called by my name, if they humble themselves and if they will confess their sins and turn away from them, he says they will forgive. Why don't we call? Because there's a difference between God rebuking. He said, Oh God, I'm sorry, forgive me, and God forgave him. So if it is sin that is stopping or hindering your prayers, why not simply just tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm sorry. And as we learned this morning, love everybody around you. Love the brethren. Love the neighbor. Love the strangers. Love your enemies. Love everyone that comes across your way. Start at home, love your husband. Start at home, love your wife. Start at home, love your children. Well, they are not perfect just like you are not perfect, but love them anyhow. They sometimes offend you just like you sometimes offend them. Love them anyhow. Let the word of God be in your life. Then be a, be a, be a, be a person who prays. Remember that God can work miracles. And no matter how much you have ruined your life, God is able to repair what you have ruined. You know when you see a 
motor vehicle that had accident on the side of the road. And uh, that vehicle is totally ruined. A writer. You say, how can this ever come on the road again? Then a mechanic will come and take it to the workshop. And then you feel well, brother. There is no hope. And then eventually a panel beats it. He supplies the things that are missing in that uh, motor vehicle. He overhauls the engine. He puts the glasses in the proper places. And eventually, if they have to change the key of the of that vehicle, they change the key. They repaint it and touch it everywhere. Eventually, they bring it out after just a month. Well, the owner might have to walk to the office or take a taxi or go by public transport just for that month. But after that month, the vehicle comes back and it becomes a totally new vehicle. Don't you know on the road of life, your business might have had accident. Your marriage has been ruined. Your spiritual life has collapsed. That's just like the vehicle on the, on the side of the road. That happens once in a while with human beings. But yet, if you bring that collapsing life to the workshop of the Lord, it's a champion heavenly mechanic. He'll repair your engine. Well, it may take a week. It may take two weeks. It may take a month. But he will repair it. He will handle it. Just when you repent, say, God, I surrender. The person that has the collapsing vehicle does not take it from the workshop before it is finished. Sur surrender that life into the hands of God. Give your ruined life to God. Say, just as I am, I come, I come. My, my life is ruined. My marriage is collapsing. There is no joy in my life. My business is going. My spiritual life life is at, z at zero level. But you realize that God, that is God's uh, specialty. If you come as you are, God will change you. He will repair your life. The victory you have lost, he will give you. The success you have lost, he will give you. If you have the word, if you will pray, if you will manifest faith, love everybody around you. Before I see you next Sunday, you will be a changed person. In your business, you will see a change. But in your family, in your family, just this afternoon. Now, if you just say, go back home, and you have not been eating together with your wife, and your wife put the food on the table, and say, wife, I'm waiting for you that we eat together. Your wife will think that we gave you medicine to eat here in the in the fellowship center. And before you eat, you just say, my wife, will you? Forgive me, I know that I've neglected you. I, I know I've not loved you enough, but you are the mother of my children. And I just want to tell you I love you with the love of Jesus Christ. Or if you are the wife, you get back home. I just smile to your husband. Just embrace your husband. And just remind your husband that even though you were bad in the past, but from this afternoon, of course you love you love him. Get to the place of work tomorrow and greet the gate man. Greet the receptionist. Show love to everybody, all the co workers. And the director, the manager, you have been bearing grudge with. Just go to the manager, the director, and say, I just appreciate you. You are the director here. I have, I have belief, I have confidence in the way you are guiding us in this place of work. That place of God will change for you. See all the co-workers and every time you meet somebody just wave your hand and give a smile and say how are you, are you fine in the Lord? Everybody will say you are drunk. Drunk of love. Drunk of the word of God. That place 
of work will change. Your family will change. Your business will change. Your marital life will change. Your spiritual life will change. When you become happy everywhere you go. When you love everybody that you see. When you regulate, regulate your life on the word of God. You are prayerful and you believe in God. I believe we are starting a new life this day. I believe that victory is ahead of us. I believe that success ahead of us. And from this afternoon, I want you to make up your mind. I will be successful. I wish I be successful. Rise up and let us pray. Hand over that light to the Lord. Let him start with you where you are. If you have committed sin in the past, just tell the Lord, don't hide it. Just tell the Lord, I'm sorry, I've committed sin. If you have been manifesting anger and bitterness, very good. Don't hide it. Just tell the Lord. If you have not been living according to the word of God, you are selfish, you are inconsiderate. Don't hide it, just tell the Lord. If your marriage is broken down, your business is collapsing, your personal life is ruined, your spiritual life is nowhere, there is a remedy, just tell the Lord, and a change will come. Come as you are. Don't pretend before God you are not an angel. Just tell the Lord who you are, how you are, how you feel. He will change your life. Your marriage will become better. The image you are having about yourself, that image will come to fulfillment. If you are seen, I repent and God will forgive you and God will save you. Almighty God, we thank you and bless your name for the good things you've been doing in our lives from the beginning of this minister's conference. We thank you, Lord, for the ways you've ministered to us and for the men and women you have used to enrich our lives. We pray, Lord, that all that we learn and all that we receive during this conference will get us into a better place of ministry and will do your will more than ever before in Jesus' name. We pledge that you give us your grace, that we'll be enabled to do the things our hearts have been challenged to do. Make us faithful and steadfast in the things of the Lord. Speak with us in your word now and help us, Lord, to get the best from you and to do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are preaching the subject of Christian marriage and the family life. And as adults, ministers, children of God, we already understand that such a subject like this cannot be handled lightly. Because apart from our salvation 
and relationship with the Lord. Our marriage and family life may determine our happiness on earth and the possibility of our getting to heaven and being with God eventually. By and large, it may determine our failure or success in the Christian life as well as in the Christian ministry. That's the reason every child of God and every minister will take seriously the teaching, the doctrine, the admonition, the warning, the encouragement of Scripture on such an important subject like this. I'll touch on three subtitles. Number one, God's plan in Christian marriage. God's plan that a Christian is to submit himself to, adjust himself to, and submit his own plan to in Christian marriage. Number two, scriptural Christian family. Not traditional or African or even American family, but scriptural Christian family. Number three, influence of marriage on ministry. The influence, positive or negative, the influence of marriage on ministry. Let's go to number one. God's plan in Christian marriage. In Hebrews chapter 3, 13 and verse 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But us and adulterers, God will judge. This verse of scripture tells us that marriage, if we keep to the plan of God, if we keep to the revelation of God, if we keep to the purpose of God in the institution of marriage, that marriage can be honorable in all. In all meaning, in all people, in all nations, in all generations, in all ministries, in all communities. It means that marriage in the church can become so edifying, so uplifting, and so encouraging, and so fulfilling by everyone, or through everyone and in everyone, if we discover the blueprint in the word of God concerning marriage. Yet he tells us the bed must be undefiled. That tells us that as profitable, honorable, edifying, uplifting as marriage could be. Yet, because of the world in which we live, and because of the flesh, and because of society that has gone in the wrong direction, and because of the fall, and because of the depravity of man, instead of the honor and the edification, there may be defilement. And so then he wants the Christian man and the Christian woman to understand that the bed must remain undefiled if the honor and the glory and the blessing and the profit that we ought to have in marriage will be preserved. If on the other hand 
We do not remain faithful, loyal to God, keeping holy and without any blemish. The allmonger and the adulterers, the unfaithful ones, and the ones that break the marriage covenant. The world may not judge because the world calls it a common problem. And society may not even power it because society has lost every kind of norm and standard. But God, who keeps the standard, will judge such an individual. Well then, it's very important that we have a good foundation on which to build the Christian family. And as we're talking to Christians, no doubt the majority of you might already be married already. But we're preachers of the word. And we who are preachers, many times, you need to come to the position of the young people in your church. And you need to be able to direct the young people in the church what scriptural steps they will take so that they will be able to plan their Christian marriage very well. You are not telling them your own example because you might have been married when you were an unbeliever. You are not showing them that this is the way you got married because you might have been immature and immodest and unscriptural even though you were a Christian when you got married. You are not telling them that this is the way I did it and so you young people, this is how to get married because you might have depended upon a human matchmaker rather than on God, the author, and the one that instituted marriage. So, as a minister of the gospel, you are not coming to tell them that, well, I am married already, and this is how I did. You point them back to the scripture. And so that you will be able to know how to lead those young people, so that they will not ruin their Christian lives. That's why it's important for you to notice all these scriptures we're going to read in Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14. Houses and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife is from the Lord, as ministers of the gospel. We know all good things and perfect gifts come from God and they come from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of variableness or turning. How do we get those other good things from the Lord? Salvation comes from the Lord. Christian experience comes from the Lord. The blessings of the fulfillment of the promise of God, they come from the Lord. How do we get them from the Lord? By prayer. Depending upon the promises of God. So then, a prudent wife, like all other good things coming from God, will receive by prayer. So we challenge our young people. That if they are going to marry and marry a right, because a prudent wife, and of course, by parity of person, a prudent, a good husband also comes from the Lord. And how are our young people to get that from the Lord? By prayer. Jeremiah chapter 3 and in verse 4. Will thou not from this time cry unto me, my father? Thou art the guide of my youth. Here God was calling upon the children of Israel. He saw the tendency in the children of Israel to become independent of God. To think that they could take decisions, major decisions, without 
asking from the Lord. And because they were so slow in understanding that God needed to guide them, he then asked them, Will you not from this time cry unto me, My Father, thou art the guide of my youth. He expects that our young people will call unto the Lord, will cry unto the Lord, and say, My Father, I am young. My way is slippery. I find myself at a crossroad. And I am undecided. I am just a boy in your hand, an infant of yesterday. I know next to nothing. I don't even know myself fully. Neither do I know the other fellow at all. I do not know my own future fully. Neither do I know the future of the other individual. I see even a little of today. Even what I see of today is so much limited. Not to talk of seeing anything tomorrow. Therefore my father, the ancient of days, the one that knows the end from the beginning, the one that is able to declare that this is what shall be tomorrow. You are the guide of my youth. So we teach our young people that they should not depend upon the pastor to be their guide in marriage. They should not depend on a man, a woman in the church to guide them in marriage. Neither should they depend upon the guidance and the advice and the matchmaking of any committee, grey-headed committee or young people's committee, whatever kind of committee, that it is the father and the father alone that is able to guide without making any mistake. And therefore you pray to God, my father, thou art the guide of my youth. Because we need to make our young people realize that if they are born again, God has made them specially for himself. In Isaiah chapter 43, from verse 21, these people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. Our exhortation and message to our young people who have not got married is that God has made you for himself. And because you belong to God, may you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, and ye are not of yourself, because you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Because of that, this young Christian is not of himself, and is not by himself. He is formed for God, recreated and born again for God. Therefore, they shall show forth my praise. So we want to tell our young people that your life, from this moment, so you see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face, is to show forth the praise of God. And young people will tell them, there is one thing that can matter, that calling of your life, that you will not be able to show forth the glory of God and the praise of God. And one of the serious things that may hinder your beaming forth and showing forth the praise of God in your life can be marriage. Therefore, you take that marriage seriously and you call upon the Lord, telling him to guide you. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2, the first part of verse 2, thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. We are surrounded by pagans. We are surrounded by heathens. Heathens 
who have Christian names, heathens who have denominations, heathens who go to church, heathens who are educated, heathens who are professionals. And these heathens surrounding us, they have their own way of getting married. It may be by the recommendation of daddy and mommy. It may be by the recommendation of an old classmate. It may be by casual social interaction. We've met together, we seem to like one another at first sight, and he may fit my life, she may fit my life, the way of the heathen. It may be at the dancing hall that these heathens meet together, and because of being able to dance and step to the rhythm and tune, then they feel that they may be made for one another. It might be that they met at a party. All these parties that are going on, and then as the singers sing and as they discuss and drink and eat, they get introduced to one another and then visitation will begin and eventually marriage will result. It may be that it is through the consultation of our family people, they've gone to consult uh, with the oracle of the village. And the oracle has said, it is the man downtown, that is, that your daughter is to marry. But then, our young people are to know that now we are different. Because if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new as the new creature in Christ. Different and distinct and unique. And you are not of the world anymore. Because Jesus said they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Then when you come to this important area of marriage, what the Lord is telling you is that you are no more part of them. You are no more a pagan. You are no more a godless fellow without Christ, without hope. And you are no more part of the world. So, learn not the way of the heathen. That same chapter in verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We adults need to know, and young people need to know, that man cannot guide himself. Since the time of the fall, a cloud has come upon the mind and the heart of man. In fact, even as Christians, people who are born again, we still need to know that in many, many, many things we are blind. Born again, will not yield to temptation, will not want to go the wrong way. In many, many things we are blind. Samuel was the person that had known the Lord from his youth. And the Lord had been speaking to him. He had been hearing the voice of the Lord. And the Lord sent him to go and choose a king for Israel in the house of Jesse. And no doubt, Samuel knew the way of God, the voice of God, the leading of God. And he got there. And he got the people before him. You cannot refer to Samuel as an unconverted man. Neither can you refer to him as a carnal fellow. Neither can you refer to him as a prayerless Old Testament person. Neither can you refer to him as an ordinary personality in Israel. This was the minister and the prophet of God. And his prophecy already had had national note. Because he was the one that chose Saul. He was the one that gave Saul responsibility. He was the one that knew that God had rejected Saul. And his prophecy had become notable in the whole nation. You cannot call a fellow like that an ordinary old Testament believer. He was among the very selective ones 
that uh, shone beyond all the others. Now he came to the house of Jesse. And when he saw one of the sons, he said, This is the anointed of the Lord before me. And he said it emphatically, assuredly, confidently. And God said, Samuel, I have not chosen him. If Samuel could make a mistake, those who have not been able to have a prayer life to the one tenth of the prayer life of Samuel, they can make mistakes. So because even though we are Christians, there are areas in which we are blind. That is the reason we go to the Lord in prayer. And we do not just make a choice, a selection by ourselves. Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verse 16. I will lead the blind by a way that they knew not. Let me stop there for a moment. Maybe you open to that verse 16. It says, I will, I will lead or bring the blind. By a way they knew not. Then you close that page. You say, that's not for me. It's talking about the people of the world. Those people who are blinded by the God of this age. The God of this world. Let me look for the verse that is meant for me. Before you close that passage, read verse 19. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf? As my messenger that I sent. Who is blind? As he that is perfect. And blind as the Lord's servant. Now you can come back to verse 16. You know that verse 16 is for you. There are many times we pass over passages. I will say, I'm a Christian already. I have sanctified common sense. I love the Lord. I am a child of God. All this talk and preaching, much ado about choosing a wife, choosing a husband. Don't you know that I want to get to heaven? I know my consecration. Young man, pay attention. Peter, who bragged more than you are bragging, he wrote bitterly later. Stop bragging. Who am I and who are you? If God doesn't guide us and lead us, if he leaves us a single minute to take decision by ourselves, if they cry beyond the grave, that man will continue to cry. Verse 16. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in the paths that are not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them. I will not forsake them. Praise the Lord. The joy we have is that our God is a good God. He's a loving God. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. In fact, he says, why don't you come to me and tell me, thou art my father. My father, thou art the guide of my youth. Let us encourage our young people. Don't make yourself their God. Don't call as a pastor. Don't call any young sister, any young brother, and say, I am here to guide your marriage. I am here to make sure you don't make any mistake. Privately here, our members are not here. Can we say that we ourselves, ministers who are married, from what we see in the marriage now, if these young people that we are trying to tell that we will choose for them, we will dictate to them, we will guide them, we ourselves, at their not times, we went into the corner and we said, 
Oh God, well, I have married, I have married. If we adults who are married already, if there are times that we are to go back to pray to say, well, oh God, I will not pray negative. I have married, I have married. Why do you make yourself God? Why are you putting yourself as the matchmaker? As the one that is going to choose for that man, choose for that woman. Let them make their choice. Teach them the word of God. Don't have preferences. And don't say, well, uh, that brother is so useful in the church. We don't know his future. Because he's so useful in the church, then you are talking to ladies. You ladies, are you not thinking very well? What do you think of brother so and so? You are going beyond your territory. You are putting yourself in the place of God. And you are going to a level that is even going to be more serious than blasphemy. You are saying, uh, you have been praying, praying, praying. What prayer are you praying? When I am here. Okay, tell me your mind. What is your prayer? And uh, being led to sister so and so. Sister so and so. Shut up. You young people don't know anything. I am your pastor here. I know everybody. You are thinking about sister so and so. I about sister such and so. You become God. And when the rod will fall upon you, we will all be praying not knowing that you committed something greater than blasphemy. Leave the young people alone. Give them the word of God. Once you give them the word of God, let them go and pray. And let them be faithful to that word of God. That they will depend so much upon God, they will be able to have their own testimony. You didn't give them salvation. God gave them salvation. If salvation is greater than wife, the God who gave them salvation, can he not give them wife? The one who gave them sanctification, the passport to heaven, the God who gave them sanctification, can he not give them husband? He can. You don't know the temptations they are meeting in their places of work. In all those temptations, they meet temptation at school, they meet temptation in the place of work, they meet temptation in society, and God gives them grace. You are not there. God will give them the grace to live the overcoming life. Some of these young people meet more temptations than even you meet because you are always in your, in your room reading Bible and you are in your, uh, on your pulpit preaching the word. And when you are secluded, these young people who are not secluded, they meet greater temptations than you are even facing. And God is giving them grace to overcome. If He is giving them grace, uh, will He not give them wife? Why are you doing the work of God for, the, for Him? Teach the word. And give them the word of God and then leave them alone to make their decision. What if they make mistake? We believe God is there watching over them. He has said he will not forsake them. And he will not leave them. If they make mistake, you will point them back to God. But you will not correct that mistake by choosing somebody for them. So, let us tell our young people that it is the Lord that will lead them. And it is the Lord who has said he will do this for them and he will not forsake them. In Psalm 37. Psalm 37, reading from verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Our young people who are serving the Lord, our young people who are committed to the things of the Lord, there is a desire in them. And sometimes you need to hear the young people pray. The consecration they express in their prayer. The commitment they express in their prayers. And God sees everything. And what the Lord is telling our young people is that they should concentrate serving the Lord. If they will serve the Lord and deny themselves in the Lord, He will give them the desires of their hearts. And I believe the Lord will do it. But then, our young people have some things to take note of. Because the decision is in their hands. It's between them and God who they get married to. 
What then are the things they need to understand? Number one, marriage is for matured men and women, not for boys and girls. Marriage is for matured men and women. Therefore, let's encourage our young people that when they are young, let's let them face their education. Let them face wanting to have a trade, wanting to have a profession. Let them mature physically before they begin to think of marriage. Number two, there is a necessity of growing and developing morally, spiritually, educationally, professionally before thinking about marriage. We need to tell these young people that marriage is not like a toy that children play with. It is not like something we try and test and then if it doesn't work out then we'll see what we are going to do later. Once you get into it, you get to a point of no return if you want to make heaven. Therefore, let there be spiritual development, spiritual understanding, moral development, ethics, the way a man ought to live, an unselfish life. Let him develop what it means to care for other people. As they interact together, young people, show them that they should just serve without thinking that may be my husband, that may be my wife. Just serve, just interact and develop qualities, social interaction among the children of God. Like they can be in the choir or they can be working together or if we have physical work like building the church to do, let them get the work done and as they interact together, uh, you push me, I push you. Or we tell them to serve food together and they don't get enough food. And if they try to get uh, unhappy or something, we develop them. It is in that interaction of the sisters, the brothers and everybody as they are interacting together, we begin to see the rough edges in their lives. And we say, sister, you are born again. That one should not be there. Uh, we say, brother, you are a new creature. That one should not be there. Uh, brother, it appears that whenever things don't go your way, you are always rough, you are always unhappy. Life is not like that. Things will not always go your way. We will strike out and knock off the rough edges that are in their lives. Before they can think about marriage, we must develop them morally, spiritually, educationally, professionally. Number three, let them channel their youthful energy towards worthwhile endeavors. Before they ever think about marriage, let them settle on worthwhile endeavors that we will know that a person, if he want, if he's going to be um, a mechanic, is already settling down before thinking about marriage. If uh, he is going to be a tailor, already is settling down on that profession before thinking about marriage. If he's going to be a secondary school teacher, he's already following the educational line to qualify himself before thinking about marriage. If he's going to be a farmer uh, that will use mechanized uh, things, already he's developing a profession. He wants to have something in hand, a work that he's doing, so that when he grows up, he'll not be like a vagabond. He will not be like uh, just a, a person that is shooting here and there. No work to do. Let him get involved and channel his physical, youthful energy towards worthwhile endeavors. And let him commit himself to it. And if he is going to really serve the Lord, like he is going to be an evangelist, he is going to be a missionary, he is going to be a preacher, let him already know the indication of God upon his life and let him be preparing himself in that endeavor before ever thinking about marriage. Don't you know that it was before David got married? Before he even thought about marriage, God's hand was upon him. And when God's hand was upon him, eventually the Bible says concerning him, that is David that will fulfill all my pleasure. So then, we need to understand that our young people 
instead of uh, they come to church, they are born again, and it is not two months yet that they are born again, they are really thinking about marriage. And somebody is saying, I want to get married, I want to get married. You say, where were you born again three weeks ago? Ah, it's a long journey. Before you think about marriage, there are other things to put in place in your life. And um, we sometimes uh, ask a young man, are you going to, you've been uh, seeking counseling? He goes to that pastor, he's looking for counseling. How can I get married? And he goes to that pastor, how can I get married? He goes to that pastor, how can I get married? And as we come to the conference, he has gone already to three, four pastors. How can I get married? And none of those uh, people asked him, where do you live? Do you have accommodation? They squat you with somebody. No bed. No mattress. No pillowcase. He doesn't even have plate or pork of his own to eat. He manages here, manages here, manages here, and he's seeking for counseling on marriage. He didn't seek for counseling on getting a job. He didn't seek for counseling on whether he's going to be a farmer or somebody that will keep wood or sell something or do something tangible that you will know that this is a matured man, a developed man. Therefore, let us tell our young people that before we think too much of marriage, let them get established in something that they can do, that we will know that they are actually getting ready for matured life, adult life. Idleness will bring carelessness and mischief. Number four, maintain purity of life and live above reproach. Our young people, brothers and sisters, before they think of marriage, let them develop the purity of life. If uh, a young man is saying, I cannot hold myself, I cannot hold myself, how are you going to hold yourself even after you know that there is the will of God to a sister? And then you are going to have cut sheep of some months before you eventually get married. If uh, what is making you to rush into the marriage is that I cannot hold myself again. I cannot say I can. And I'm dreaming about this. I'm thinking about this. You're going to get into a problem. Before you get into that marriage, you will have the grace of God. You will have the discipline. You will have the self-denial. You will be temperate. And your body will be under the control of the Spirit of God. Not that your flesh will control your spirit. Or your flesh will control your mind. There must be a way. You know our little children. This is how they train them in school. If our children, uh, when they go to school, they give them examination. When they are very, very young, they limit the examination to about 20 minutes. Because they are teaching them that when you are having that examination, if you rise up and you go to the toilet, you are going to lose time. Then, eventually, they already learn how to discipline themselves within those 20 minutes. And then, when they get a little bit higher, the examination may be 30 minutes. And they are disciplining themselves that if I've held myself for 20 minutes, I didn't go to the toilet during the exam period, these 30 minutes, they hold themselves. And then, eventually, examination becomes one hour. Eventually, when they get to their university level, these are teenagers, three hours, they're sitting down the exam. Although there is a feeling of going to the toilet, already now they have become matured and disciplined. That they do not yield to that pressure of going to the toilet. They stay there and finish that exam. And when they finish, as adults, they go to the toilet. And you can see that some of us don't even have this discipline, that discipline. There are people that, if you are hearing the message, and the message has just gone on for 20 minutes, and I'm still to go on for, who knows, a marriage message may take three hours. If um, I'm still going to go on for three hours, and uh, there you are, 20 minutes already, you are going to the toilet. Well, if you want to go to the toilet, I'm not indirectly disturbing you. Now, the point is that even before these young people get married, or before they think about marriage, let them have the maintenance of purity of life. And let them be able to live above reproach. Number five, stay close to a matured Christian of the same sex. 
That means if you are a young man, stay close to a mature Christian who is a man. If you are a young woman, stay close to matured women who are Christians. It's uh, very, very bad. You know, there are things you will never learn from a man if you are a woman. For example, as a pastor, I'm a man. And if you are a lady in the church, there are things you can never, never learn from me, which you will better learn from a matured Christian woman. I can teach you the Bible. I can tell you a lot of things. But yet, there are things peculiar to you, experiences of life, that these matured women, Christian women, are passed through, which I will never pass through because I'm not a woman, but which they have passed through, which they can share with you. And when you walk with the wise, you will be wise. Therefore, if you are a woman, a lady in the church, and uh, in deeper life, we are so organized it. We have the overseer, then we have the women leader for that state or for that region, whichever is the case. If she is in the state capital, she is over the state. If she is in the regional capital, she is over the region. And if she is in the local government, this woman is over the women in that local government. If it's a local church, then that woman, the Christian matured woman, is over that local church for the women. And the way we've done it like that is because we know, I know that our overseers, I praise God for them. They are fiery, they are wonderful. I mean, you listen to them here as they preach. Even sometimes when I listen to some of our overseers preach, I say, can I preach more than these people? These people can talk. But then, even though they can preach, and I praise God for them, you know, all these, did you hear that message last night of referring to that history, 18 something and 19 something and 17 something? I said, what? I said, where did these people get all this material? Now, even though they preach like that, they are men, and there are things that they will never be able to teach you young women. Because they don't have the experience, they are men. Therefore, you young women, you will go to those women. The matured women. That's why the Bible says, the aged women will teach the younger women how to love their husband. I can tell you theoretically, love your husband. Love your husband. Now, that's my duty. I must teach you that. It is that elderly woman that has gotten married and even her husband was also difficult before her husband was not born again the problem of sabbath or not sabbath the problem of in-law and all the problems she has gone through everything the pastor has not gone through that because he is a man and you are a young woman and you go to that elderly christian woman and that woman will say this is how to do it if your husband is not born again, my husband was not born again before, but now my husband is a pastor and a Christian man. How did that happen? That elderly woman will teach you. And then how, my husband is always complaining this. Com That's how my husband was complaining before. How did you make it? This is how I made it. There are things these elderly Christian women that are in the leadership can teach you which the state overseer the man cannot teach you even the general superintendent as a man cannot teach you that is why we have these women there i pray that this great opportunity and privilege god has given to you younger we younger people sisters i pray you will not lose it in jesus name now number five i said stay close if you are a woman if you are a lady a sister stay close to matured Christian sisters like yourself. If you are a young man, you have not gotten married, then stay close to matured Christian men. If you have not married, avoid being a lone ranger. You see, when you are a lone ranger, living alone, traveling alone, holding to yourself, you are not going to have anything to do with anybody, you like the lonely life, 
You know the problem is that when you are discouraged, nobody will be able to get at you. You shield yourself from everybody that you may be dying. Nobody will know. Any bad thing may be happening to you. Terrible temptation happening to you and nobody knows about you. Don't do that. Avoid staying alone. Avoid living alone. And avoid traveling alone. And of course, avoid going to questionable places. Number six, be selective in the novels you read. Because you see, some of these novels will have some very suggestive tempting, enticing things. And as a man, or as a lady, even though you are born again, we thank God you are born again. But you see, when Satan told Jesus Christ, and he said, jump down. Because the scripture says that the angels will take you in their hands, that will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus Christ said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You see, sometimes uh, our young people will say, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. And I have the grace of God. I can read anything. I can watch anything. You cannot. Don't uh, put temptation before yourself. So be very selective in the novels you read, in the materials you read. Stay away from pornography. Pornography on paper. Or pornography on the screen television stay away from pornography number seven pray seriously and patiently and confidently now if you want to cook your food you begin cooking that food before you become terribly hungry if you wait until you are terribly hungry and your stomach is grinding and biting before you go to the kitchen to cook you are not going to eat good food that hunger that is grinding and biting is going to make you horribly get something and say I just must eat now by all means it's the same thing in marriage if you wait to start praying until the need for marriage becomes heavy on you and serious on you to the point that you are it's almost like if i don't see that life partner today today i don't know whether i can remain in the kingdom of god if that is the time you start to pray you will marry any dick and harry that comes along but if before you even feel the biting need, before it is, becomes a pressure on you, while you still have your senses, you still have yourself, your vision is still bright, you know you are going to serve God, you know you are consecrated to God, when you are still saying, this Bible, nothing will take it away from me, heaven, nothing will take it away from me, and you are consecrated and committed to the Lord, and it even appears, I can even do without marriage. That is the time to pray about marriage. Don't wait until it is too pressing upon you. That then you will just be saying, Oh God, do it now, do it now, do it now. And then say, Thank you Jesus, thank you Jesus. I've got it. And you've got rotten egg. Pray seriously. And pray patiently. And pray confidently to know God's perfect will in marriage and I'm telling you I want to assure you he will give you the perfect will he loves you so much that he doesn't want to see you make a mistake he loves you more than the pastor loves you, more than your daddy loves you, more than your mommy loves you more than the whole church together loves you and he doesn't want to see you make a mistake in that area, Jesus died for you he knows the price, the blood of Jesus by which you were redeemed. And if you really want to serve the Lord, the Lord is not going to leave you to yourself in such an important matter. He will guide you. But you have to pray. Then number eight, evaluate the leading. That is, you say the Lord is leading you to this brother. The Lord is leading you to that sister. Evaluate that leading with how God has been leading you unmistakably 
in the past. Abnormally, leading you in marriage will not be the first time that God has led you. Our young people, we thank God for them. There have been many decisions in your life before the decision of marriage. It may be a decision on your education. Maybe the decision on having a particular friend that is your sister, a friend who is another who is a sister, or a brother, a friend who is a brother. Many, many things the Lord has led you in the past. Very definitely. Now, in this area of marriage, evaluate. The leading you say you have now was the leading that God has been leading you in the past. Oh, you will say, the way God normally leads me is this. Then you give us this example. Then you give that example. Then you give that other example. And you say, I thank God. In all these areas, I cannot regret. Because the Lord led me. When you evaluate the present leading in marriage with the other areas of leading in your life and guidance in your life, then you will be able to say assuredly, this is the leading of the Lord. In now number nine. Seek counseling and confirmation of church leaders. Counseling and confirmation. Now, this doesn't mean that the pastor is going to choose for you. No pastor must put himself in the place of God to choose for anybody. But, sometimes we make mistakes. I told you about Samuel. And we need to understand this in a balanced way. That a person made a mistake in marriage. He has not married. But he felt this is the will of God. Let's say for example. A brother comes to me. And he says, I seen the will of God. Oh, and I said, who is that will of God? And he said, his sister, so and so. As a pastor counseling many people I may know that that sister already is even engaged or that they have gone to see their parents or that already they have even done something at the registry and they are just waiting for the church to join them together and this my good brother is coming to me and is saying I've seen the will of God and he tells me excitedly and I say who is that and I say sister so and so what do I do? It would be wrong of me to say, the cause of this mistake, stop the work you are doing. Because Samuel, again, Samuel came and was to choose. And he said, the anointed of the Lord is before me. And God said, no, he made a mistake. Did God stop him? I said, did God stop him? We are pastors here. Some pastors are harder than the Bible. In the name of maintaining the standard, God has put me here as the pastor. I am going to maintain the standard. I will scatter everybody. Maintaining standard. He made a mistake. So we tell him, gently young man, that is not right. This sister you are talking about is already engaged and in fact the announcement is just about to come out. If the brother said, oh, I'm sorry about that. I'll go and pray again. Finish. We we'll encourage him. Don't get discouraged. God will choose just for you. Anybody can make a mistake. But... If that brother said, Pastor, no. Even though they get married like this, in this our church, I will still wait. Because that one cannot be the will of God. The dream I had, when we were under the same umbrella, that dream can never be broken. The dream is equal to the scripture. Ah. And we say this one is too much. Then we discipline that person and say, Go and pray very well. Go and stay. We don't want rebellion in the church. We don't want a person to know more than the Bible. 
when we tell you that this person is engaged, that this cannot be the will of God, that you are being misled, are you greater than Samuel? Please go and pray that we understand. But if he accepts his mistake and he says, Oh, I didn't know. I am very sorry. No discipline. There's no problem. Do we understand? And so, we must seek counseling. Do you see we seek counseling? It's just to find out if the person is engaged or if the person is already married. If the person is not engaged, well, now the brother, okay, go and talk to her. Or if there are other people, other brothers that have come, it's okay, be patient. Because other people also said, they saw the will of God to this sister, you must be patient so that there is no partiality. First come, first served. If you are the will of God, be patient. Let these other people that came before you, let them go and talk to her one by one. If she says no to all of them, then we will give you a chance to talk to her. Let all things be done decently and in order. Now, number 10. Inform her after you have sought counseling and confirmation. And then you will seek the parents' consent. Church did not give birth to that sister. So I have told pastor, it's not enough. You will go and you will inform, after she has accepted, you need to inform her parents. But please, before you go to inform the parents, commit the hearts of all concerned to God. Don't just rush to the parents. Some parents are difficult. Pray very well. The same serious prayer that you prayed to discover the will of God, pray a similar serious prayer to commit the hearts of the parents to the Lord before you go to the parents so that they will be able to agree with the will of God. Now, you may go on the first day the parents, my like Pharaoh, may say, what God's will? I don't know that God don't think about marrying that individual. Now, that doesn't mean it is not the will of God. It may even take months. Because when Moses went to uh, Egypt, and he said, let my people go, it took some time. It took the manifestation of the power of God over and over and over again. Before Pharaoh and the people of Egypt, before they said, okay, we realize this to be the will of God. It is not just the idle dream. Here idol, here idol. It is not just the idle dream of Moses and the elders of Israel. So then, you commit their hearts to the Lord so that when you go there, the parents will be able to submit to the will of God. The heart of the king is in the hands of the king to turn it and bend it whithersoever he will. Number 11. There will be courtship. That courtship period is the time now you have known the will of God, now the parents have agreed. It's the time of discussing together. Very, very important. Because you see, two different personalities are going to get married. Two different people from different backgrounds are going to get married. It is necessary to discuss. But please, in the discussion, let us make sure that we're scriptural. When I say we're scriptural, already we know that there should be no morality. Every child of God sincerely knows that. But there should be freedom to express each one's mind. Sometimes we find that when the sister expresses her mind, that well, from what we have been learning in the word of God, when we get married, I expect that our extended family relation will not be living with us. Sometimes the young man will jump up and say, she wants to control me. It is not the will of God again. How can you marry somebody that will not be submissive? How can she be dictating to me that our extended family will not come and be living with us? She is not going to be a slave. Let her express her mind. And let her come back to the scriptures. When Sarah told Abraham and said that Hagar and Ishmael must go. And Abraham being the head was feeling, how can this be? 
God said, that thing that your wife said, that Sarah said, that's the truth. Release that woman and the child. Let them go. During the time of the courtship, we must understand that there is freedom to discuss. We must be able to say that, well, this woman has expressed her mind. The man has expressed her mind, his mind, so that there is no confusion at all. It must be scripture based, following balanced principles, honoring God, and there must be freedom from sin. And it is at that time there is adequate provision and preparation. Now, number 12. There should be moderate, reasonable, model wedding. We don't want a kind of society wedding that destroys all that the church has been teaching for one whole decade. The church has been there for about 10 years. And the church has been teaching the word of God, the standard of the world. And then somebody wants to get married. And in one day of wedding, all the standard the church has taught for ten years or more, everything is destroyed. You must be very, very careful. In fact, my own counseling will be, my own exhortation will be, make it even lower than your expectation. To be very careful, extra careful, that you don't do anything. That other people will say, look at it. Look at what they have been teaching us. And look at their reception. Look at their wedding. Look at the things. Look at the way they lavished money and wasted money on reception. No moderation anymore. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Let's rise up and pray. Then we'll get to the rest after we have prayed.